Hello everybody, I hope you're all doing well and welcome back to my podcast, Esme's Country Life. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thank you to Fairfax and Favour for sponsoring this podcast. Um, If you didn't know, it's actually their 10 year anniversary this weekend, which is very, very exciting. I'm actually going to badminton with them this weekend, so be sure to listen to next week's podcast, which will probably be all about that. But um, Fairfax and Favour, if you don't know who they are, they are a um, premium country brand. They do really really lovely boots. Um, the Regina's are very popular. I have those. You can get lift different kind of coloured tassels. They also do beautiful bags. Um, you can match the boots to the bags and the um, they do trainers. They also do other sort of footwear such as sandals, so especially with the summer coming around. Um, but anyway, yeah, thanks again to Fairfax and Favour for sponsoring the podcast. Um, also, a huge congratulations to Marcus and Felix as well for 10 years. That is just incredible. And anyway, let's get into the podcast. So starting off, for today's sort of episode I really wanted to talk about what it was like growing up with non-equestrian parents in the horsey world because I think a lot of you have you know you've watched my journey from back when it was just me Mickey and Casper to me now with four horses which little old me back in the day never thought I'd ever get my own horse let alone having four which I know is quite a big number but also you know in my job I do feel like Sometimes I feel like definitely imposter syndrome in the sense that I come from a completely non-horsey background and growing up in the horsey world, I always felt like I wasn't quite there or I wasn't quite an equestrian, if that makes sense. Like every single thing I did, I felt like, oh, I feel more like a real horsey person. And if you come from a non-horsey background, some of you might also kind of relate to that. Um, But in my job, definitely, like people, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but I've done so many wild things, such as, you know, I met Pippa Funnel and did a course walk with her, um, who was kind of like one of my riding idols when growing up. I think I, I was... I wasn't, I don't know if I could say I was starstruck. I was a little bit like, not flustered, but the first thing I did say to her was a little bit embarrassing. I said, <laughs> I said to her, um, I played your DS game when I was a child and I really enjoyed it. Um, back before, you know, the Nintendo Switch. I was going to say us oldies, but I'm not really that old. I'm 21. Back in the day for me growing up, I didn't have a Nintendo Switch. I had a Nintendo DS. I had the light version, which was in baby pink. Very pretty. And anyway, um, I used to play like a horse game on it and it was Pippa Funnels. I don't know. It was some sort of horse adventure game. I really enjoyed it. I used to play that before I got my own horses. And you know what? I used to always pick a grey horse on the character customization kind of thing when you picked your horse to start with. So there we go. It was obviously destiny. But um, yeah, a, a question I get a lot is why do I have four impractically coloured horses? After the first one, after Mickey, I was like never getting a grey again, even though he's a Cromella. I was like never getting a white grey Cromello horse again. They are too much effort, but you know what? They just seem to they seem to come into my life. But um, yeah, back to yeah meeting Pepper Funnel. That was wild. I've met lots of other you know top horsey celebrities. I've ridden um, horses of top athletes. Like for example, um, William Fox Pitt. He let me ride his badminton horse like a few weeks before badminton. So that was wild as well. So little me when I first started off riding even before that I think even though I did start learning to ride at a very young age and I'm very very grateful that I was able to do that at the age of five I still remember what it was like before I had riding lessons I grown up always like in the middle of nowhere in the countryside um, on a small little small holding slash farm or I guess you could say out of use farm because my parents weren't farmers. We just had a little bit of land and trees. But um, all of my, I grew up in a very rural area. So a lot of my friends, especially at nursery, actually, nursery and primary school, I had um, two of my best friends, both had very horsey parents. They um, basically had been in the saddle since before they could even walk and talk. And um, I remember really wanting to do horse riding, not only because my friends did it, but the local riding school would ride past my house. And as soon as I could talk or kind of like point out the window, I'd point and I'd be like, I want to do that. I want to do that kind of thing to my parents. Um, and they were always very much, not in like a mean way, like, no, you can't do horse riding. But apparently before I was even born, because um, they worked in um, A&E quite a bit, they saw a lot of 
um, people coming in with horse riding injuries. <laughs> so um, yeah, apparently they used to tell everyone when my mum was pregnant with me, like, nope, my, my daughter is never riding a horse. <laughs> She's never having horse riding lessons, that kind of thing. And look where we are now. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I was, I was very persuasive for multiple years. And I know like for, basically from the age of two to five, it doesn't seem like, girl, you weren't asking for lessons for a long time. I know there are lots of people that have probably asked for horses or asked for lessons for many, many more years than me. But still, I remember, I remember, this is so sad. I remember going to our local tack shop or feed shop to buy food for the donkeys. And yes, I was very lucky to have donkeys, but my parents are no way at all horse people. They kind of if you listen to my previous episode of the podcast, you will know um, the kind of story behind the donkeys and how they came about. Uh, my parents just kind of, they were kind of abandoned slash my parents were kind of given them with the house. So um, they had a lot of, I was going to say Googling, I don't need, I guess, was Google a, dad, was Google a thing back then? <laughs> no. Um, no, the internet really, yeah, wasn't much of a thing back then. But um, anyway, so they had to do some research somehow to look after these donkeys, but we would obviously go to the local feed store, tack shop, that kind of thing, um, to pick up food for the donkeys. And I remember every time going around, looking at all the like bits and bobs in the tack shop and just kind of like being like, oh my goodness, I can't wait until like, well, I just, my parents always be like, oh, maybe when you're older, like they'd say the same thing about a dog. And I still like, I'm older now, haven't got a dog yet, but one day, one day I will get that dog. <laughs> but I remember looking around and looking at all the like grooming brushes and head collars and all of the pretty things, you know, every, every equestrian know what it's like to be in a tack shop. It is just heaven. And I'd just walk around like dreaming and I'd see kids getting like their helmets fitted and boots fitted and things. And I was just like, I just really want to do that. And it wasn't actually until a friend's fifth birthday party that I actually sat on a horse for the first time because mum and dad weren't there, you know. And um, they were, their excuse to me was always like, oh, you're too small or you're too young because I was, I'm a June baby. So um, in our, in UK term time, I know it's different in New Zealand and, in, and Australia. You kind of do it like the, the year, like January to January kind of thing. But we do it September to September. That's our school year. So being in June, being in the summer, it was, I was always like the last to have my birthday, the last to yeah, be changing age, which I felt like it wasn't really like that bad. Like maybe when I was like a little bit younger, it, 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 this is such like a weird thing, but in my primary school, our, our like reception teacher, she was so lovely. I feel like every like first school teacher is always like one of the most lovely, wholesome teachers ever. And she had like a little tin and it had sweets in. And if it was your birthday, you could get like a um, little packet of sweets. So I remember being like one of the last people to get this packet of sweets. And I was very patient. I was like, no, it's not my birthday yet. <laughs> not my birthday yet. <laughs> Seeing all these kids getting these sweets on their birthday. And then finally on my birthday, I got my sweets. But that was for my fifth birthday. Anyway, <laughs> back to my other, my, my friend's fifth birthday on a horse. Got to ride that for the first time. And oh my goodness, I just remember being so happy, so excited, like the best feeling ever. And I was like, oh my goodness. I'm I'm old enough now. They let me ride the horse. They and I was tall enough as well. It's not because I was too small, because I was a little bit smaller as well. Um, so I was like, yes. First thing I said to my parents, like, they let me ride a horse. They told me that I was like old enough and that kind of thing. So um, then it was like my fifth birthday that I started having lessons and absolutely loved it at the local riding school. And this is the bit that uh, little me was a little bit, not sassy, but part of me and my brain was like, uh, how is that right? Because when I started having riding lessons, my younger brother Max also started having riding lessons. And I was like, girl, he's younger than me. Well, back when I was, you know, four or three, how come I didn't get riding lessons back then? So um, anyway, he had riding lessons with me as well. We literally just started off... Um, I actually remember this. I remember my first riding lesson really vividly because it was the best day ever. I rode a grey horse, I know, grey horses again, um, called Foxy. And um, bit of an interesting name. You'd think 
you'd go for like a chestnut to be called Foxy. But anyway, um, and then my riding instructor, I remember her teaching me why you needed to put your heels down um, and her kind of like standing there and um, being like, if I'm on my tiptoes, I'm going to like fall fall forward. But if I'm sit, sitting with my heels kind of down, that kind of thing and explaining it all. And I also remember really vividly being told like how to hold the reins, to hold them as if I was holding... This is what I always tell like beginner riders when I teach them how to ride as well, which I feel like is actually a really good analogy for how you're supposed to hold the reins. So um, they told me, hold the reins like you're holding two baby birds. You need to make sure that you're holding them tight enough so they don't fly away or you don't, you know, lose your reins. But also you don't want to be holding it too tight um, so you squish the baby birds because that's the same as, you know, holding the reins if it's connected to a bit in the horse's mouth. You don't want it to be too tight because if not, that's going to be uncomfortable for the horse. So that's kind of like a good way of talking about pressure, especially to a very young child as well. So um, I remember we the local cool riding school, I think it was after a year or after a few months, actually changed. So they didn't ride past my house anymore. They moved to a different stables within the village. Um, so I had a few lessons at the first, at, it was the same, same people, same ponies, same, but just a different place. So the first one, um, I just had a few lessons going up and down the road, that kind of thing would all kind of follow the leader on the lead rein bobbing along and then um we when it moved to the other place they had some woods that you could go in so we'd go for rides in the woods and I think it was when we moved to the other place that Max started having lessons as well because my parents were like I've got to take Esme there Max was just you know tagging along as well might as well plonk him on a pony as well so he doesn't have to walk and he's happier um and it was actually it was a really good riding school I know um there are some riding schools that are a little bit dodgier or not so great and everywhere basically but the one I went to was incredible like as we were riding along in the woods they would teach us about um different horse breeds and like talk about the ponies that were in the um ride and why they were different we would talk about different pieces of tack so I'd actually learned quite a lot of stable management when I first kind of learned to ride a horse obviously when you're five six you're not going to take every single piece of information in because you're only, you know, s still learning the alphabet and that kind of stuff at school and numbers. But um, I remember, like, my parents also finding it really useful because they would obviously walk along with us on the ride and they were taking quite a lot of the information too. So even things like... Um, they would ask us, oh, what would horses eat? And then down the road, we'd all have to come up with different answers. So like one kid might come up with like apples and another one might come up with carrots and somebody might say like, hey, and stuff like that. So it was really good learning also. And then we'd always have like a little trot right at the end, which was my favorite part. I used to, well, I still do love going fast. So that was my favorite part. And then in the, in the like Easter, they would have um, like a little Easter egg hunt and you'd ride around and there'd like be little Easter eggs you'd have to spot when you were riding around so they, they are definitely some really fond memories we would literally go like rain or shine even in the winter if it was like hailing or windy or raining like we would go to that riding lesson have hot chocolates when we got home and um so I remember yeah those are literally some of my most fond like childhood memories when growing up and then I remember when I was old enough I think I was probably about seven six seven so maybe after a year of riding um yeah probably all right six seven yeah a year after riding in the woods they were like okay Esme you are good enough now to um have lessons in the arena with the big boys and girls and I was like oh my goodness I've made it I'm allowed to ride in the arena and you know what in the arena means going faster so we did lots more trotting lots of learning to turn and steer and basically slowly and gradually I was taken off the lead rein um so that was really good fun um I, a lot of people have like asked me in like Q&As and things like can you remember what it was like to canter for the first time or can you remember what it's like to jump for the first time it's weird how I remember my first lesson really vividly and I don't know I just can't really remember cantering for the first time I think because my riding school didn't really make it like a big deal I feel like some people like learning to do something like that for the first time, it can seem like it is a big thing, but I feel like if you make it like a really, really big thing, then it can be more off-putting or more scary or more of like, it seemed like more of a big challenge when I think I was just like trotting around and I think my horse just went a little bit faster because I was like, go, 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 because I was so excited to go fast. And um, we had like a little bit of a canter at some stage. It was probably just something like that. And I remember with jumping, we did loads of pole work first. So I can't actually remember, like it was probably like the tiniest cross pole on the ground where it was like on 
the bottom hole on each. So it was barely like even like a raised pole to be honest. But I don't remember it ever being like a big thing or being scary. I just remember wanting to jump higher and go faster. Um, I thought I'd talk also about some of my like most memorable ponies that I rode or some of my favourites. Um, there was a little grey Shetland called Lucky who was really old. He's probably no longer with us now. But um, he was probably like 30 something back when I was riding him, to be honest. And um, he was adorable. He was, yeah, tiny. So he, I used to ride quite a lot when we used to ride up and down in the woods. Um, there was a black horse called Sammy that I used to ride. All of these ponies were probably in between 10 hands and 12, 13 hands, maybe. And um, there was also another Sammy as well. He was a Palomino. There was... Um, Toffee, he was a chestnut that was a little bit more on the chunky side. I don't know if he was a cob, but cob kind of style. Um, and then there was Joey, who was one of my favourites. And I, don't, I think he might still be at the riding school because I actually, when I did my Young Equestrian Leaders Award, that was the same riding school that I went back to and I would volunteer at. So I, it was actually really lovely to see some of the familiar ponies that kind of started me off on my journey back there again. And um, when I did all the leading and things and looked after the kids, it kind of it really reminded me of what it was like to, when I first started. And yeah, it was a really, really wholesome time. But anyway, um, back to, yeah, learning to ride again. Um, yeah, Joey, the he was a Welsh, I'm pretty sure it was a Welsh section A, grey, and he was so speedy. Everyone wanted to ride Joey because he was the speedy one. Like, he would go. Um, there was one, there was a horse called Ellie, and I remember, this was when I was getting a little bit older now. I was probably eight at the time I remember feeling like okay I'm one of the old ones now because I did help out a little bit on like Saturdays I felt like one of the big girls because I'd help do like leading and mucking out and that kind of stuff before I had my own horse and um I remember be feeling really honoured when I was allowed to ride Ellie because she was also a grey for some reason greys again um because she was only I think she was four or five probably five she was very young and I remember like at first I was a little bit like not sad but I was like oh I kind of wanted to ride Joey today and they were like um they're like no you're riding Ellie and I was like oh okay and I think that's when I like my kind of young brain was like oh I want to go fast I want to have fun like and then when they put me on Ellie I, that's kind of like where I felt like I kind of matured a bit as a, as a person because I realized the reason they put me on Ellie is because the other some of the other kids couldn't ride her because she was so young and she needed training and they obviously felt that I was a confident enough rider and a good enough rider if like maybe like she'd just just do little things where she was a bit of a baby where like you'd ask her to go left and you'd have she'd like drift a bit to the right and you'd be like no 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 we're going left or things like she actually used to struggle with canter on one rein as well she'd get disunited so um had to do lots of trot changes to get that correct so that was I felt very honoured when I found out like that's the reason why they wanted me to ride her not because oh I'm on the horse that can't canter weirdly on her right rein or whatever and oh like she's the horse that like kind of drifts off to the side and actually I was like oh that is why they want me to ride her because they think I'm good enough to be able to train her so I was like this is really cool um and I remember me and my friends we would have I think we had like riding lessons after school on a Wednesday sometimes as well as like on the Saturday and um me and my friend I remember we would we would love being at the stables so much that we would hide in the hay bales and the hay barns so our parents couldn't pick us up because they wouldn't know where we were they definitely knew where we were because we'd be like giggling and squealing and screaming I don't know what children do but um yeah there's some really lovely memories there and then it got to the stage where you know I'd been having lessons for quite a while and um obviously being a horse mad child not uh, not in a rude way but I was very like polite about it I'd always like ask with please and thank you and that kind of thing to my parents being like could I maybe have like my own horse or I kind of knew that getting my own horse straight away was probably a bit too much of a dive into the deep end so um we came kind of like not a compromise but the next kind of stage after you know learning at the riding school was like okay it would be really nice to get a loan pony now my riding school actually did a really lovely thing where you could loan the or 
for Americans, lease. I'm going to say loan because that's kind of what we say in the UK rather than like a lease horse. But um, you could loan some of the ponies at the riding schools. So, for example, if like Joey was your favourite, that's kind of one of the reasons also why I didn't ride Joey as much as I got older because number one, he was probably like 11 hands. So I was getting a bit taller. And number two, I think somebody actually loaned him out. So you could pay a little bit more to the riding school and you could like say that was your loan pony. So um, you would always get get to ride them in your lessons you would um be able to like do more stuff with them like you could take them for hacks on like a sunday and that kind of stuff um also at my running school which i don't know if i i can't i don't think i've said this yet um on like a wednesday for my wednesday lessons it was really good because the kids or myself we would go up to the fields we would um put the head collars on we would lead them down from the field we would groom them we would tack them up and we were taught to do all the kind of stable management things I feel like not all riding schools do that a lot of them you kind of turn up get plonked on a horse go around a few circles and then you're done like it was very much like horse first at my riding school and um so that was really lovely that I got to learn how to do all of that too um so anyway back to yeah lone ponies so one of our my mum got chatting to one of the other mums at school which was also the mum of one of my really good friends and um she was like look we've got this horse at the moment that my son's starting to outgrow my daughter rides him sometimes but not all the time and we're looking for you know somewhere like livery to keep him and my mum was saying that you know oh my daughter's looking for like a lone pony so we came up with the arrangement that um this horse bradley could be kept on our um land kind of thing in return that I got to ride him sometimes and she was like this is great get free livery I can just help out muck the donkeys as like a thank you and um you know Bradley gets exercised as well you know win-win situation so I remember being so excited I was buzzing that there was a horse on the yard I don't think the donkeys were the biggest fan of Bradley because he used to like chasing them around the field and things um I don't know, that might have actually been the first time the donkeys have ever met a horse. Um, so anyway, we had Bradley there for a little bit. That was I had a lot of fun riding him and it was also really nice because my friend's mum um, did a lot of, like, not teaching because she wasn't like a riding teacher, but she, you know, I, kind of teaching, yeah. She kind of helped me and helped me learn about different things when it came to horses. So he, um, he was actually the first horse I ever fell off on. We did... Um, it was actually, it was a really weird, like, way to fall off. It, we were actually on the lunge, and I think I turned too tight to go over the jump, so I was going around, she was lunging, and, um, yeah, I think I just did a little sidewards whoop. And um, I remember, like, I remember this day really vividly because it was, like, a hot summer's day, and I did, like, kind of, like, a roly-poly, and um, I remember being, like, oh my goodness, I've fallen off, this is the best thing ever, because I remember all of my friends that had been riding for years were like, oh my goodness, like, how many times have you fallen off? And I was like, oh, like, never. Like, I, like, in my head, I kind of like, oh, I've never fallen off. Like, I'm such a good rider. I've never fallen off before. Like, what are you doing on the ground? This kind of thing. <laughs> all sassy me. When actually they were all like, well, my mum says that you have to fall off seven times to be a good rider. And I was like, I've got to fall off seven times. That's like almost as old as I that's that's almost as old as I am. That is a lot of times kind of thing. And um anyway, I remember being quite excited after my first fall. I think most kids are probably like a bit shaken. They're like, oh my goodness, I've hit the ground, I didn't like that. And I was just like, let's do it again. <laughs> anyway, um yeah, I just remember being really excited. So um it was really lovely to have my friend's mum, who actually helps look after the horses sometimes when we're away now. We're still really close with her, so that was really lovely. But yeah, she was the yeah she was there and she helped me a lot like learning to tack up and things as a kid so I'm very very grateful for all the time that she gave to me and helped me with that um she had some other horses that actually were kept on the yard um she had this big chestnut called Reuben I remember at the time being like this horse is gigantic he was probably about 17 three like 18 hands he had hooves like the size of dinner plates he was massive and I remember like he was I think he was the first horse I sat on bareback I remember sitting on him and um being like wow I am so high up like it was yeah just very like lovely childhood memories just sitting on him out in the field because he was like a big gentle giant um and then they sold him and then um it got to the stage where like their son had properly outgrown Bradley so um 
we had to look for kind of like a new lone pony for me because we kind of knew that he was going to be sold. So um, then we found Lola. And all this time, actually, I was going to say, I haven't even talked about this yet. All this time. Um, so I don't think this is allowed at riding schools anymore. I don't know. I could be wrong. So I remember talking to someone who's been in riding or their daughter's been in riding school recently. Back when I learned how to ride, this kind of shows like I'm getting a bit older now. Um, health and safety has definitely changed a lot in the last few years Um, when I learned to ride there was in the tack room there'd be like this huge trunk or huge box and it had loads of different boots in and they had like a number written on for what size shoes they were now I feel like you could probably still like borrow riding boots when it comes to riding because my parents were like look if she goes through a pony phase and this isn't her thing we've just spent all this money on riding boots all this money on you know a helmet and she's like you know what this is not for me like (laughs) they're not going to be very happy so my parents were like let's do every everything as cheap as possible so um I always like when I learned to ride at the riding school would have like the borrowed riding hat so I would be there like an egghead because it was a skull cap but because it was a riding school they, they didn't have any like hat silks so I'd be going around like a little egghead child and there were obviously like you could always tell who the fancy kids were at the riding school because they all had the nice hat silks and um like they had the like lone ponies and that kind of thing um and I was there with number four written on my forehead <laughs> and um I was actually like even when I was loaning um Bradley my parents were like she doesn't need her own helmet like sh- you know she- she's all right she- so um I actually I think the boy had outgrown hit um Bradley's like boy owner that sounds weird Bradley's like child that was riding him um he had outgrown his helmet so they were like oh do you want it because I used to used to wear it on I was, I was riding him kind of thing which health and safety do not do that do not number one do not borrow do not buy or no, I don't even buy we just got it for free do not borrow or buy or get secondhand helmets and number two it's not good to share helmets either because obviously someone's head isn't the exact same shape as you know the, your helmet kind of moulds to your head and if you have lots of different heads in one helmet it's probably not very great but anyway yeah the thing I was saying about health and safety at riding schools is they probably don't allow you to share helmets slash have like a riding school helmet I don't know if you if you have to buy your own nowadays which oh, poor parents I feel for you that is expensive but I guess it's better like safety is number one priority 100% um anyway my first helmet my second hand one was actually a Charles Owen one so there we go on brand um it was this this is like proper old school this is like I was gonna say this is 90s even though I wasn't alive in the 90s I'm a 2001 baby but it was velvet with a fixed peak and it had a bow on the back and um yeah that was my helmet and it was quite like big and bulky as well especially I feel like definitely more compared to the skull caps maybe I don't know but I feel like in the UK that they're still very prominent in the showing world like that's what a lot of people wear for showing I feel like for showing when you've got all the show gear on and you're looking presentable looks great but when you have you know a pink um t-shirt with a horse on I don't know as a child (laughs) just it's, it's definitely retro definitely retro but um I loved it I remember being like oh my goodness I have my own helmet this is the best thing ever um I used to just ride in wellies which I know is not safe either again non-horsey parents trying to save money where they could they were like you know rubber riding boots wellies they're like the same thing so I was there with like my purple and pink barbie wellies on and um riding horses and the reason why actually if you didn't know the reason why wellies aren't very safe is because you need to have a shoe that's got like a a flat sole so if you get your foot stuck in the stirrups you know your boot can slide out if not you can get it stuck and also these wellies are probably a little bit too clunky as well anyway so I don't think I actually got my first ever pair of riding boots until we bought Mickey, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that, like, my parents were like, yeah, we're not investing any money into this sport until, you know, 100% this is what you want. I feel like every moment they were just like, no, 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 this is not for you, girl. Anything else? My mum was like, let's stick it, let's carry on with the dance lessons. I did dance lessons from the age of three until the age of 11. It was when I left primary school, went to secondary school. I had to, I had to stop because number one, I was like, ah, not for me anymore. I want to do the horse thing like way more but also part of me was like it was also because like school times like the time I finished and the dance classes started and we couldn't get there in time and stuff like that but anyway um I 
what was I even talking? I'm really good at going off topic with these podcasts. <laughs> Back to, yeah, Lone Ponies. So I had this Lone Pony after Bradley called Lola. She was a Welsh section A and, um, again, would borrow, like, riding boots, helmets, hacking jackets. Like, all my show gear was borrowed off. Um, it's actually my hairdresser who... or my old hairdresser. I don't think she does hair anymore. But um, we loaned her for a while. And um, we did... That's when I kind of did... I was in my pony showgirl era (laughs) where basically um she wasn't like a show pony she hadn't done much hacking she wasn't great in traffic she was a little bit like she was very young as well I remember I think I was seven and she was seven I remember being thinking it was really cool that we were the same age and um she bought it for her grandchild who wasn't quite old like he was or she, he or she, I can't actually remember the gender of that grandchild, but she bought it for some, one of her grandchildren, um, to, and I was kind of like the guinea pig in the sense that I was the child that can train it up and ride it, so by the time her grandchildren are old enough, it'll all be good, so that was kind of the arrangement with the loan pony as well, I don't know if we even paid anything to loan Lola, but anyway, we were training her up, and, um, I went to lots of shows, all on the lead rein, because she was very nervous, and, she hadn't been to shows really before, but she was a very pretty pony. She was stunning. She was a bay with a white stripe, I'm pretty sure. She had beautiful dapples. Um, so I did a lot of shows on her, and um, I did, like, a few Jim Carners. And that's... I didn't, don't want to say I lost my confidence, but that's when I wasn't as, like, let's go fast, because I had quite a few falls on her. I remember being in a car park at a show and falling off, like, just in the car park because she spooked at something, so... Um, I feel like my full tally after that added up a little bit more with her, but I still have lots of fond memories going to shows, doing lots of, I loved the, like, in-hand leading classes, because I was like, this is great, just go around, look pretty, and get a rosette, and I was like, that's when my rosette kind of collection started to build up, I was like, this is great, I had a, um, a bed, and I'd, like, have a little bit of string on either side of, like, my bed posts, and I would hang all of my rosettes on there, so that was my little rosette collection, very proud. Um, I remember my first show, actually, it was at the riding school before I had any lone ponies. It was like a pony day on a Saturday slash show. And um, we did, like, lots of different gym carners, that kind of thing. And I remember coming second, and I got a blue rosette. And one of my friends who was a year above at school... Um, he had a pink rosette and I was like, oh my gosh, can we swap? Because I want the pink one. And my mum was like, no, you can't swap. He did worse. He got sixth. You got second. You should be proud of the second. I was like, oh, okay. And that's when I, re- that's when I you know, realised that coloured rosettes actually mean like different placings. I just thought, how come he's got a pink one? Pink's my favourite colour. I want that. <laughs> but there we go. Average, you know, sassy six-year-old. So after having Lola for a little while, we actually, like, the owners of Lola were like, okay, she's a little bit of a handful. We can see that she's not, not not that she wasn't doing well with me, but they were a little bit like, um, if you want to buy her, you can buy her, like, it's all good. Um, so we actually thought about buying her for a little while, and then my life, well, I was going to say my life could have taken an absolute drastic turn, because at this time, my, um, parents were thinking about emigrating to Australia, so we actually, I was going to say we moved to Australia, we didn't, like, legally move there, but we went over there and spent just under two months living there, three months, yeah, just under three months living there, and for a seven, eight-year-old, Living three months in a different country feels like a lifetime. So for me in my head, I lived over there because three months of, you know, seven years, it's a a big chunk of time. Um, So we actually like traveled all across Australia. We stayed in like different apartments and places, but we also had a, a caravan, not a caravan, a caravan that has a motor. A motorhome, there we go. Brain is not working today. Um, So yeah, we went around Australia in a motorhome. That was awesome, had lots of fun, did lots of snorkeling. Like I am a water baby, I love, oh, I was a water baby as a child, I'm an adult now, but I absolutely love anything to do with water, swimming, that kind of thing. So I remember also having some absolutely incredible memories, like once in a lifetime kind of thing, like swimming with, like as a seven, eight year old, you have no fear. Like, fear does not exist. So I remember swimming with sharks, swimming with stingrays, seeing crocodiles, massive spiders, that kind of thing. And um, they moved, we kind of went around because my parents were thinking of living there or moving there. Um, In the end, they decided, because it's just so far away from all of our friends, all of our family, um, they decided, you know, it wasn't for them in the end. So um, after traveling around, and actually I got quite homesick especially when I found out that if we did move, my parents would probably have to sell the donkeys. And I just remember, like, before 
we were like a few weeks when I knew that we were going home soon being like oh I really want to see Bruno, Toby and Willow I really miss them so I did actually get a little bit homesick by the end of the trip um, and it was coming up to Christmas as well by the time we were going back home so I remember coming back home being like oh my goodness it's so grey and so cold I'll go back to Australia again <laughs> but no I, I did I did feel like very much at home when we got back again so you guys, to show you, my life could have been totally different if we moved to Australia instead. I knew that my parents were like, we'll try and get a property that has like land or something if we could afford it or be somewhere where you, there's a stables nearby because they knew at that stage that riding was definitely something I really wanted to do. Um, also around that time, like seven, eight year olds don't ha really have major life decisions. But for me, this was a major life decision. I remember this is like one of the first big decisions in my life where I was like, wow, this is gonna alter the pathway of my life forever kind of thing because I really also, alongside doing horse riding, really enjoyed doing gymnastics. Now I know this is definitely like, this is like a very first world problem. Like this is, you know, this is not a, this is not a problem at all, but when you're seven, it's a big problem. I was like, um, my parents like, look, if you wanna do the horse thing, we will support you. We'll get you like a lone pony or that kind of thing. Um, maybe one day you can get your own horse. We'll have to see on like budgets and things because horses are very expensive. Or if you want to go down the gym, gymnastics route, which was also for me at the time getting very competitive, um, they wanted me, I was going twice, two, three times a week and they wanted me to go like four and I wouldn't get home until like nine o'clock, which for a, a child is quite a late bedtime. And um, so they were like, look, you can only do like one out of the two. Both are becoming very time consuming. They're both becoming like a lot you can't do both or you can do both but you can't do them like fully like you could carry on having lessons at the riding school you could carry on having gym lessons but you wouldn't be able to do all the competition and you wouldn't be able to have a lone pony kind of thing so I was like okay and then I came to the, the decision especially when we were in Australia I kind of made like the decision out there I was like what do I miss more doing gymnastics or being with the horses and a hundred percent it was being with the horses I was like I can I can do a cartwheel in my garden but I can't just go and you know hop on a horse in yeah can I like just randomly if I feel like it so I was like no like horses definitely have my heart and that's you know what I can imagine I was like I can imagine myself being 40 and still riding horses but I'm not going to be 40 and doing like the splits I mean if there are people out there that can do the splits at that age not even I can do that so hats off to you but um yeah that's in my head I was like yeah it's it's definitely horse riding so um when we came back from Australia and settled in in that kind of thing that the next year so going into to yeah when I was eight so I think we're going into 2010 was when we got Mickey um for the little Esme timeline here um we started looking at another loan pony because Lola we Lola we couldn't buy in the end um because she had laminitis my parents were like look she's got a health problem she's lame at the moment, you can't ride her, we can't buy a horse that you can't ride kind of thing because you want to do riding. And I was like, okay. Bradley had um, been taken away by his owners or they'd actually sold him, they'd sold him to someone else while we were away. So I kind of came back to the UK, horseless, ponyless, that kind of thing. And I was like, okay, what, what, what's going on here? What, what are we gonna do? So um, we kind of asked around that kind of thing. I remember spending hours um, on the computer searching up like horses for sale and I'd like find one and be like oh this one looks really cute and parents like girl that is like a four-year-old that's been freshly backed you're not getting that or I'd be like oh what about this one and my parents like that one is up in Scotland we're not driving all the way to Scotland to try a horse I was like okay and then we found I think we found it through the people that owned Bradley the lady that clipped Bradley also clipped Mickey and then we went and tr saw Mickey. I remember finding out that he was a Cremello and was like, okay, I need to search everything on the internet about them. And I remember looking at loads of pictures and I was like, oh my goodness, they look like actual unicorns. They're like fully white, pink skin, blue eyes. I was like, wow, this is like so cute. And my mum, I remember my mum looking at pictures and being like, girl, this horse is so ugly. <laughs> like, what? why do you love it? And I was like, but he looks like a unicorn. Look at his little pink nose. He's so squishy like a marshmallow. And my mum being like, N no, he, he looks like a naked mole rat. But <laughs> I don't think she actually said that, but that's what she was probably thinking. Um, so we went to see Mickey. We tried him and I you know, horse girl mad me, was like, I absolutely fell in love with her. I was like, yep, we're taking him home. This is the one. Yes, girl. Yes, please. And um, there are like, like, like 
little things that I remember from that day. I remember going over some poles and jumps and my parents being like happy with him in the sense that he was a very bomb proof pony. Like he was super chill, very good with beginners, young riders, that kind of thing. And, um, I remember them being like, okay, this is great, especially compared to Lona, who was a little bit on the skitty side. She was a little bit, you know, spooky. Uh, so like, you know, we just want a nice safe pony that my daughter is not going to injure herself on. So um, we talked to the people and they were like, yeah, we're happy to loan him out to you. You can come to your yard. We'll drop him off. Obviously, make sure that you've got a nice place where he's going. I, also, I don't know what it is with loan ponies, but um, or just ponies in general. The Per, the rider that used to ride Mickey before was also a boy as well. And apparently he loved Mickey so much that he said on the morning that they were taking him to us that he was going to get a knife and make a hole in all of the um, trailer tyres so they couldn't drive him away. So it goes to show Mickey is a very, very loved pony. Um, I think he used to do like, Mickey used to do like pony club or I think maybe they did riding club actually with him. So he'd, he'd like been there, done that when it came to just like bits and bobs like seeing the world and he was 10 at the time so a really good age like he'd seen enough of the world but then he wasn't like super old either he was coming up to his prime um so anyway yeah this is such a like a weird memory but I remember playing not hide and seek with Mickey because I don't know you can't really can you really do that with a horse but eight-year-old me was like we played hide and seek because I'd like go under the stable and he'd put his head down and I'd pop up and then he'd pop his head up but I don't know if he was just like had hay and was like putting his head down to eat the hay or something like that but in my head we played hide and seek when I first met him but there we go um then yeah I remember the day that Mickey came home being like one of the best days ever being so much fun and we actually like little me only thought that we were like loaning him they were like we'll loan him on trial and my parents I don't know if they told me you know it's loan with view to buy or if it was just like we're just loaning him because they didn't want me to get my hopes up but um because I had so much I was like very upset obviously when Lola didn't work out and she got taken away and that kind of thing so um anyway we oh yeah and the reason why we didn't buy Bradley was because he was still like he was just a little bit too much for me being like he was he was like a he was a black cob who was very speedy and competitive when it came to like show jumping and I don't know maybe he wasn't quite in budget or maybe I can't really remember but he was just like a little bit too much for me being more of a beginner rider and he was used to having like a 13 12 year old boy riding him kind of thing so anyway Mickey came home best day ever I remember being so excited actually no even better was the day before maybe the day before because I was just so excited we went to all of the local tack shops I bought everything in blue because I was like he's got blue eyes even though my favorite color is well I was gonna say was lilac it is kind of lilac my favorite color kind of changes quite a lot but I do really like lilac and I remember thinking like now boys at boys anyone can wear pink lilac whatever color but I was like I don't know if I want to put them in lilac and then I thought what's the next best color to lilac baby blue so I got everything in blue for Mickey I got my little grooming kit I got a head collar for him that was about it. That were literally like the two things that we bought for him. <laughs> Again, my parents were like, horses are expensive. He comes with a tack and everything else. Like, he's going to be all good. Um, I remember he came with a pink rug. Um, so I could have got stuff in lilac for him or pink anyway. And um, his previous owners were like, yeah, it was on the sale and nobody wanted this pink rug. So we bought it. And it kind of, lo- it actually looked really cute on him because he had a, has a pink nose. So um, he had this pink rug in the winter, <laughs> which was very cute. But um, there we go. Um, that was, yeah, one of the best days of my life, Mickey coming home. And then after like a month where little old me had absolutely fallen in love with Mickey, my parents were like, okay, as we've got some big news, Mickey is now officially ours. He's never going to be taken away. He is yours forever. And I remember just like being so appreciative, so grateful and thinking I never thought this day would come, like ever, ever. And it probably doesn't seem like much of a, like a big thing, but when you're, when you've been asking for riding lessons as soon as you could talk, like it felt like a really long process, especially when you're a child and you're that long, like a year of your life is like a very big percentage. And, you know, from going from years of asking for lessons, years of having lessons and asking for a lone pony and then years of having lone ponies to then finally at the age of eight which I still know to have your first horse or your first pony at eight is incredibly young 
But I remember being like, oh my goodness, I have made it. I am a horse owner. I have a horse. This is my best friend that I'm going to have for life. And I just remember being like so, so grateful. It was kind of like didn't really feel like it was real, especially like having non-horsey parents. And I had loads of horsey friends at school that had had their own ponies before they could talk and um, were going out every weekend doing competitions at high levels and were much better riders than me and just being so, so grateful that I had this thing and I that's when I, like, I still didn't feel like a proper horse person in the sense that, you know, I wasn't going out and competing or I wasn't going out and doing things and I was still, you know, learning, you know, parts of the bridle and that kind of stuff, but I just, yeah it was like the best time ever. So I think I'm probably going to leave today's episode here because I've been talking for way too long. I think I'm going to actually have to do a part two to this because um, a lot of, you know, this kind of topic that I'm talking about, like growing up with non-horsey parents, a lot of the funny stories that I have are actually from when I first started doing Pony Club with Mickey, when I got Casper as well, even like things today where I'm so used to calling things like not the correct term because that's what my parents call them and then I'll say it in a video and everyone in the comments will be like girl that is not correct what are you going on about so um be sure to look out for part two on that because um yeah I've I've got some really funny stories and some really interesting things of how a lot of things where things go wrong so if you want to I'm definitely going to humble myself in that episode talk about some embarrassing things and um hopefully you know I always find when I talk about embarrassing things or hear about other people telling embarrassing stories, especially when it comes to the horses, I always feel a little bit better about myself. So we can do that together in the next episode. Thank you so much again for watching and thank you again to Fairfax and Favour for sponsoring today's podcast episode. I really hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.